Can you hear us? Yes, you can hear us. Thank you. Good afternoon. You know, this is an absolute privilege to, uh, to moderate this conversation today, uh, at least for three reasons. You know, the first thing is the momentum of this topic. You know, we're discussing about unlocking technologies that will sculpt culture and communities. The second is probably that post-COVID, the momentum is clear and the ability for technology to impact our lives and to impact our communities was even clearer in the last few years. The second reason is probably here and now. You know, as committed residents of the region, we are blessed, I think, to live in countries where the level of ambition, the level of the vision is second to known. And we know that technology is part of the equation to deliver this ambition. And the third reason is probably to be uh, surrounded by those distinguished uh, panelists from highly impactful organizations on technology and, uh, and, uh, and human ingenuity. So I'm Alexis Le Canoué. I'm the Regional Managing Director for Accenture in Middle East. And in the last few years, Middle East and Saudi specifically became the place of transformation. Vision 2030 is sharing a vision between leading edge and leapfrogging. So second to known in terms of ambition, a critical driver is technology. I was reviewing recently the technology level is increasingly important. In the last six months, every month, the GDP growth forecast was going down everywhere in US, Asia, Middle East. Middle East is still at the top from 5 to 4 percent growth GDP. But what was still going up despite the progressive slowdown of GDP growth forecast was the interest in investing in technology, just going up even if GDP forecast was going down, which I feel is a bit unique as a situation. So here, you will not hear about how technology will replace human. <laughs> you will hear how technology amplify human, serve human, and impact communities. So each of our panelists will have a chance to introduce yourself and to share your insight on what you believe are the key ingredients to unlock the value of technology. So Youssef, would you like to start first? Sure, sure. Thank you so much. Um, so let me first introduce myself, uh, Youssef Khalili. I'm the head of uh, professional services for um, NEOM, Autonomous specifically, which is an arm within NEOM that um, is tasked of building the new cognitive cities and cognitive enterprises of the future. Uh, my role is to imagine, design, and deliver those wonderful cognitive experiences for Neom and beyond. Um, what are the key ingredients to unlock uh, those uh, values? Uh, in my opinion, it's, um, it's a three-pillared three approach. First thing, and for me the most important, is a high-level vision for the nation or for the city on where it's going. If you don't have that aligned with your objectives, with your values, with your culture, um, then technology is not going to help. Secondly, the human aspect. Everything that needs to be done needs to be human-centric, needs to evolve around the people. And that brings into consideration the experiences that touches the people's lives, but more importantly, the people themselves who will enable those experiences. So talent, and capabilities that are local, that needs to be groomed and developed is key, and I know you're going to touch upon that. And thirdly, the ability to harvest investments uh, that will make those technologies more localized and more in tandem with the objectives of each nation and city. And uh, some of them are unique, some of them are capabilities that are replicable, but in many cases, unlocking the value will come from adding a local flavor. So we'll come back to the local part of the equation. 
Alex, you co-founded an IoT company, so IoT smart uh, environment is part of the equation. Can you first introduce yourself and, uh, and share a bit your view of the key ingredient to unlock this value of technology? Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Alex Young. I'm the co-founder and the COO of Tuya. So what we're doing is that we're building an IoT generic platform that can help two types of people. The first one will be those device maker. Make them be able to develop the smart and IoT devices easily and cost efficient. And so every year, there will be over 200 million new IoT devices using our technology that are shipped to the global market. And the second thing we're doing is that we continue to build applications and use cases for commercial. And like the smart city, so that will be the massive scenario that IoT can help. Yep. And in my mind, that I think the two contingent for value of that, the first one will be talent. So um, especially when we search the, the global region, so there will definitely they, you can tell at some areas that the groups, people have passionate and capability about creating those type of things. And in there, actually you have enough um, anim essential elements including the investment, university, so those kind of talents will be the, one of the key to continue to create and searching for the new value there. And the second one I'll put that in will be the, I would say the cost, or I would say scale. So um, to be able to provide a affordable technology, I think it will be so important. That will be the key for you to pa help the high tech to penetrate into the market. So make this thing to become popular, affordable, and easy to catch up and use. I think, I think the cost will be one of key, essentially. Muxit, I hear that you, you work in a great company, so I leave you introduce yourself <laughs> and, uh, and, and elaborate a bit about what you see as the key ingredient to unlock the value of technology in that context. Thank you, Alexi, and it's uh, great to sh uh, share the stage uh, with Yusuf and Alex. Uh, I think we, we came between refreshments, so we'll try and get the energy up here uh, as we talk through um, you know, a very important topic. So I'm Muxid Ashraf. I'm the uh, chief executive of Accenture Strategy, which is the, call it the strategy consulting advisory arm of uh, Accenture. Um, you know, I work at the intersection of business and technology in terms of transforming companies, uh, and uh, a big aspect of that is, of course, uh, how do you adjust um, and upskill and reskill talent and also reinvigorate and reimagine cultures and organizations, right? So coming back to the, uh, the discussion at hand around technology, I think one of the aspects just, I mean, I think it's very well understood is, um, is the exponen exponential impact technology is having on uh, the outcomes for companies. Uh, we found that the leaders or even the leapfroggers um, you know, with respect to technology, are actually outperforming the laggards by a multiple of three to five times. Uh, and if you take even disciplines within technology, you take AI as an instance, even some of the, the front runners um, today comfortably within that technology area are, are, are outperforming their peers by about 50%. Um, that being said, only a very small fraction really falls in that leaders group, right? So, you know, we're talking about 10 or 12% of the companies that really represent the high performers. So, so what is causing that gap between what is, you know, what is the true potential of, energy, of technology and what is actually being realized? We believe it's three things. And my fellow uh, panelists here actually touched on several of the elements, but the first is, you got to think of technology just not in the sense of being an enabler um, and more of, um, you know, sort of outside in. You got to put in a technology at the core of your vision, your, your economic country vision, or your business strategy, your enterprise strategy. Often we find the technology um, is treated in, in silos. You think of disparate solutions often reactive, addressing certain needs. And what we found is 80% of the executives are on board with technology being crucial to the transformation of their businesses or governments finding that as instrumental to their vision, but rarely do they incorporate that in the, in the strategic planning process for their economies or for their businesses. So that's very important to create that link. Second is, um, 
I think, uh, a point that you so very well made, which is sort of taking a, a, a radic radically human-centric approach to technology. So the application of technology is not just, you know, putting in place, you know, state-of-the-art state equipment or capabilities in data and AI. It's actually enabling the workforce uh, to be able to make the most of it. Um, and you got to think of it in terms of the external forces that are shaping consumers and, and uh, citizens. We call it life centricity, right? It is about thinking of life as it's emerging and adjusting to those requirements. And what we have found is uh, that companies that are actually able to do, do that reap significant benefits. A typical $10 billion revenue company can actually gain three to four billion dollars of incremental revenue over five years, or could lose a couple of billion dollars of revenue over the same time frame. So thinking of that element seriously alongside the, um, you know, the, the, the focus on technology as core to strategy is important. The last thing is um, the pace of innovation and change. You got to keep up, it's not, technology is not static. You got to keep up with the pace of change. As someone said, you know, the pace of innovation or change has never been faster, and it's probably never going to be slower, right? So what you need is agility. You need an innovation uh, architecture. You just don't put monolithic entities and assume that somehow you'll get the best technologies. Um, and so those factors have to be, you know, part of how you develop and stay ahead of the curve uh, in terms of, um, you know, uh, development of new ideas. And in fact, even in that space, we found the leaders um, ahead of the laggards by up to like 10 percent points on um, EBITDA, for instance. So those are aspects which are extremely important in terms of unlocking the value of technology. So clear, you all mentioned, you know, talent, the workforce, the equation, so we'll come back to that. But before, I think there's probably one technology that we would like to explore a bit more because it's, it's a different nature and the continuum of technology together with experiences is what uh, is changing the business uh, around the world. While you can name a lot of technology, AI, VR, uh, quantum computing, uh, NFT, cloud, blockchain, the metaverse in our mind is, is of a different nature. And a uh, and few quotes on, on, on that, a certain Satya N, from Microsoft, uh, computing the real world and the real world into computing. A certain Mark Z from Meta say it's the next chapter of Internet. Uh, the CEO of Obsess saying that it's our own virtual existence. So all that describing a wave of change that is probably even bigger than the scale of what we know, like the digital wave or the internet wave. And this will apply to all, uh, to all economy. So for us, we see Metaverse as a business disruption, changing some concepts that are business uh, processes. And uh, I think there are three concepts that I, I, uh, I will share here. The decentralization, you know, uh, enabled by technology like blockchain or decentralized ledger, but at the end of the day, this is a decentralization act of the, uh, of the digital. The ownership of digital, which is changing a lot of things, especially when we think about reinventing a city or a cognitive city of the future. And the fact that we will address group rather than individual. So a lot of construction of the current digital era around hyper-personalization replaced by group attraction about scarcity created by the ownership concept of the rather than today you can unlimited browse the content and so on and so on. So those are business concepts driving to business disruption. Uh, how do you see in your respective experience and angle the future of metaverse technologies and their adaptation in your environment? You said you want to start? Sure. Indeed, metaverse is a, is, is a new culture paradigm. It's, it's, it's a new world on its own. The new meta norms are defining culture, but on its own is a different culture. We see 
that metaverse will change the way humanity interacts, works, lives, and plays. We see that metaverse as autonomous is, is a company that's championing cognitive as a slogan, cognitive transformation. We see that this whole community interaction, the human-centric interactions that happens in business, and uh, in life, in education, and all aspects of life are gonna change. It's gonna have a huge impact on the culture, which is the topic of this um, panel. But let me maybe take a step back and say, why is cognitive important? And why it's shaping all of those experiences that we're talking about? If you think of a smart city today versus a cognitive city, if you think of being um, just responding to realities versus predicting and anticipating, if you think of using 10% of the data to act upon a need versus anticipating a need before it occurs, now what does that mean? It means culturally you are raising your expectations. And it means that a city that is today a traditional city moving into smart or cognitive, in reality, becomes a multiverse city. So it's a combination of virtual and uh, uh, physical. And this tension that happens between those two defines how a human-centric experience is going to look like. So we see that what will happen is while you virtualize the real today, eventually you need to move into a paradigm of realizing uh, the virtual. And in between those two, there's a transition period that needs to happen, and a new economy emerges, which is based on a paradox today, which is the trust of data. None of this will happen. The, the, the whole data trust paradox transforming into a data trust economy and bringing all the values and unlocking all the values you spoke about in the beginning will not happen unless it's addressed and those multiverse cities will not start emerging unless this is addressed. So if I can, on a follow-up on that, because you mentioned the level of expectation going up, the level of trust being uh, critical. So, so you mentioned a reality that is totally different from just a digital twin. Correct. So can you give us some more example of what is different from what we hear about digital twin of a city and the cognitive city that you are talking about that we can build on? Sure. A digital twin exists today. So you go and look at the... Um, you know, the, the whole BIM model of a city, um, and then you render it, and you build a virtual twin of it. Now, why is that good? Because you can model certain experiences, you can model certain functions, you can um, train your workforce rather than damaging the real assets, and on and on. But what is a virtual model without a community? What's a virtual model of a city without interactions? So if there is no human-centric community and interaction and trust, then that remains a render. While you go to the uh, whole metaverse experiment, then you start thinking, OK, so now I have this digital twin, and then I build multiple experiences for communications and activities, example, commerce. Commerce as we know it will change on the metaverse. Education as we know it will change on the metaverse. Healthcare as we know it will change on the metaverse and so on. How does a community look like? How does it shape the communities? Is an interesting one. Uh, in, my, uh, in my study days, there was a cultural map that looks into countries and looks into how such paradigm shifts affect countries, economies. And now it's no longer that. It's a map that is comparing virtual versus physical. And it's not about countries. 
think of your kids and my kids being suddenly exposed to new norms that they've never seen, even in their computer games, because simply they are in a, this virtual university that accepts those cultural boundaries. What are you preparing them to do? How can they handle it? There's no one legislation globally that addresses this, and there shouldn't be, because cultural boundaries are often local, and there should be a layer that governs certain things agreed, but countries are going to face huge challenges governing this and making sure that the culture is preserved while still being open to innovation. Alex, let me pull you in and, and uh, your view on, on uh, how do you see the future of metaverse technology impacting the culture and uh, to bounce on, on the previous conversation, do you see the metaverse as a culture that will impact the communities? Or do you see metaverse as a technology that needs to be localized to the community to be relevant and to provide relevant uh, services? Mm -hmm. Okay. First of all, I think the metaverse will be like the reflection of the, of the community. And uh, it put the community in a different way. So when, when you put yourself into a metaverse, somehow you change the way you behave you, you play, you live, like, like Yusuf mentioned. And I think this, this will be a very interesting stuff. The, the Vendorverse is starting to break in all the boundaries, like Yusuf mentioned, because it's a new world with new rule and with new type of policy. And so, so you'll be able to try to change the way that you behave in there. So I think, I think that will be the interesting interesting part and that will create uh, tons of innovations new ideas out there and all the culture i think that the, the culture shock in there will, 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 will still absolutely has but in a different way and maybe a new type of you know global culture will start to form in there i think that that will be the most exciting part and so for that i will not say the universe will be like the more local stuff it's going to be a melting pot, yeah. isn't it? It's, it's, a, it a, it's got to be an interesting combination with physical <coughs> and the virtual and combination with the local stuff and with outside stuff. So I think that that's, uh, that's the way I think it will move forward to. Look at those young, young men, what they're doing today. So, right, you just mentioned, so those kids, they're not considering they will be some kind of local boy, not much now. So, so productivity. I'll give you an example. Productivity, the human productivity is expected to triple. Why? Because in the physical world, God created us in one body. In metaverse, you can exist in multiple avatars. Yeah. So you could be now doing this session and another avatar taking a course and another avatar solving a problem, right? And all of you through machine learning are accumulating experience and contributing to the economy. Yep. So the productivity is going to increase. Now, is that, is that something that will be appreciated by everybody? No. Yeah, Some cultures will not like that. No. Some cultures will be open to that. But you can defy the limitations of creation today on the metaverse. That's true. Totally, and you know, I was already under the impression that this tool was already increasing a bit my productivity, but probably 30% more than 3x than yeah. uh, as you uh, as you described. Muxit, would you like to provide your view on this future of metaverse, the nature of metaverse, and this interaction between metaverse and culture globally and locally? Absolutely. So look, I mean, we we think of uh, the metaverse as a continuum, right? Uh, it's not uh, just a I think, um, Yusuf, you talked about physical world and the digital world and how do you actually connect the two, and it's a continuum. We see that as a spectrum of, you know, a set of digital worlds, realities, and models coming together. And then if you look at the fact base, uh, before I get to the question around culture, you know, there are varying estimates uh, of how significant the metaverse would be, right? Uh, you know, they range from a couple of trillion dollars to about ten trillion dollars, uh, in terms of um, you know the size of um, of uh, activity in the metaverse in the next 
uh, 15 to 20 years by 2040. So it can be pretty significant. And even in the next few years, many of the companies um, are talking about you know, one to 5% revenue, um, incremental revenue coming from you know, being in the metaverse, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so you know, for a short period of time for an emerging technology, that's substantial. The other interesting thing is the disparity we see a little bit in the expectations. In the West, two thirds of the companies are already deep into um, into designing their metaverse strategies. In the East, it's little less than half. But what's interesting is it's not just companies, it's also countries. A country like South Korea has come back with a fairly ambitious goal uh, around, um, you know, around metaverse. Now, where do the opportunities reside and how does that have implications on the culture, right? So if you look at the different kinds of uh, opportunities, a lot of what is being done today is around experience. So it sits well in the B2C space, right? So when you think about the culture of serving customers or a culture inside an enterprise or in a country geared towards consumption, the focus is going to be around experiences. If you look at the other set of opportunities, which are more in the B2B space, they are going to be uh, more around things like digital payments, infrastructure services, right? Uh, and so that is going to drive a different kind of uh, culture chain, which is going to focus on building certain skills uh, through upskilling and reskilling and training in the metaverse that enable those outcomes. Um, Yet another type of application, which I think would be, you know, very relevant to this region, is in the en you know in the energy industry, but in industrials broadly, is the concept of the industrial metaverse, right? How do you run safe operations? How do you think about sustainability? Uh, so there are key concepts, but I think the more fundamental change, coming back to the question of culture and why metaverse, not just as a technology, but as a driver of you know, call it reinf reinvention or transformation of economies and countries is comes down to the question of of why, and what I, what do I mean by that? Right, a lot of the technologies, data, AI, uh, IoT, focus on what is happening, and how do I remediate what's happening or optimize what's happening? Right, so you you get a bunch of information, you figure out what the trends are. Digital twins do that you can kind of predict what is going to happen and you make changes. Metaverse actually allows you to get into the mind of that, you know, avatar, a real person in that virtual world and why he or she is making certain decisions, right? Because you can actually simulate that. If I am someone who's testing what a field person is doing on an offshore platform, why did he turn a valve this way to a certain setting that led to a certain outcome. What was going through his mind in terms of decision making? Why, why, why? And I think that changes the culture of how organizations uh, operate, how individuals operate. Because now you can actually get to the starting point of why the what and the how happened or was the response. And I think that is a fundamental shift in how cultures of companies and countries that evolve, right? How, why are citizens making certain choices? And so I think that is the element of metaverse that makes it truly unique from any other form of technology that exists today. Yeah, and this is impacting uh, humans. That's, uh, that was a bit of the conversation you say, the, between the productivity, the ubiquity, the ability to predict or even to forecast or to rehearse in a digital world before doing it, this is, impacting the core of our behavior and our activity as, a, as, as human. I think you all mentioned talent, adoption, human adoption in, uh, in, in the first uh, question around the, the technology, unlocking the value. So if we assume, because as you mentioned, you know, not everybody will want to jump into a world where we will be three times more productive maybe, but if we assume that here, within this group, we want to accelerate those transformation, and with the ambition of this country, we want to build the most advanced tech, uh, tech uh, adoption, uh, we need the ecosystem to nurture, to develop, to adopt those uh, technology at scale. How do you believe the region could attract, retain, 
and develop talent at scale, at speed, to address this current limit that is identified in the country transformation. Yeah, Yourself. so you to, huh? this is a topic very, uh, very dear to my heart. So you have to do both. You, you have to bring, you have to be attractive enough to bring investment and entrepreneurs into the region. Uh, at the same time, in, in enable and empower the local talent with education and abilities to join companies early on and learn. So um, I've seen success stories, but not many in terms of doing both well. So there's a lot of national programs around localization and forcing companies to uh, enable the local talent, which, which is needed, but no matter what you do, if there's no injection of brain power from outside for the local talent to learn from, there's no way they can learn anything meaningful. And they end up exiting that cycle and it's gonna be a loss in terms of investment and productivity. So, um, for instance, for us as Autonomous and as Neom at large, um, we're, we're, we're very proud of the percentage of um, Saudization and local talent we have, but I think we got this uh, formula right. We've already attracted a lot of international experts into Neom and into Autonomous that are driving and helping a lot of our local talent to become the next uh, leaders of the um, future. Um, but then there's this nice thing that you need to do, which is find projects for them to work on. Because they could join you and you can bring the experts or the investors, but there's not much work. Luckily, in this wonderful country, there is enough, um, thanks to the vision of the leaders, to work on. There's more than we can chew to work on. So as we work on very visionary products, uh, projects across Neom, things like the line, Trojena, Oxagon, uh, you know, all of, all of Neom developments, the announced and non-announced, uh, as well as at large within the kingdom, we have enough transformational engagements that we are strategically placing our younger local talent into, so that in the future, three to five years, they are able to lead those and replicate those. And um, I'm talking about really kind of avant-garde, unheard of engagements in terms of imagining something that nobody else in the world has imagined. So this is a very good chance uh, for us in Saudi to bring uh, people on par very quickly into something that they can, in my opinion, if they learn it well, they can be the champions of the future uh, outside of Saudi. So imagine us trying to enable that. Another pillar is entrepreneurship. So autonomous, we have established um, an independent arm almost uh, called Portfolio T in uh, collaboration with a Silicon Valley leading um, entrepreneurship and venture building and acceleration hub uh, called Mac 49. And the sole purpose of that, it's a five year engagement, is to be able to bring entrepreneurs into the region as well as export entrepreneurs from this country uh, equally and you know building this next one or two or even ten uh, unicorns out of Saudi to the world and by bringing those entrepreneurs investing in them enabling them to set up business here we can link them with the local talent and then the local talent can then start their own entrepreneurship journey which we can fund and accelerate through portfolio T and then help them accelerate and then be able to export. Yeah. So it's, a, it's yeah. a demand and supply. You cannot do one. You have and to do both. Yeah. And, and it's a journey. It's a journey. It I think this will take time. But uh, Alex, your perspective on the, on the talent gap mm -hmm. and the ability to retain, attract, and address this gap that is unanimously in the region seen as the limit. The vision is second to know. The ambition of those projects is second to know. Mm -hmm. But the talent gap is where we can make an impact. Any game changer idea you want to share on that? Yeah, I think that's, uh, you have mentioned the entrepreneur stuff, right? So we are just like the... Like You're one of those. One of those, yeah. come here. So I think uh, the most attractive stuff, you know, for if you want to bring any type of foreign talent here, 
is openness. I think that's that's the the major stuff. So uh, this is a this is a region that have the open market, not for anyone who can provide any type of service here with fair trading terms, and uh, and uh, they're open for any type of partnership, and make you know like my teams can live and work easier in this space, I think that, that will be the key stuff yeah. for, for, for us. And, and in, in that process, because you decided to, to come yeah. here and to bring a part of your team here, what was the key factor for you and for your team to say, okay, this is the right place to play the next bet of my career? Okay, that will say the two major factors. So the first one will be, okay, the demand. I mean the market yeah. demand. Yeah, with business. So, the market, market, so yeah, healthy. so so it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, this is a market that with scalable demand that I can I can commercialize, right? And the second part is whether this area is open for someone maybe like me that to provide and to f to fulfill that demand, to meet that demand, right? So so some 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 countries there. There should be a culture fit as well, right? Yes, correct. So, yeah. so sometimes you meet some limitation. You know what I mean? So when you when you have m many restrictions, you have to figure out what will be the cost and whether that's achievable. But you found that so this is a wide open space with with very open mindset and policies, and so let us feel comfortable that okay, I can easily fit in this marketing rules in this area and figuring out what I should do. So I think that will be the key part. So based on the, you know, in the past, this is my first time to Saudi. And only less than 72 hours, right? I almost decided that I, this is a spot I can establish a new office. We just didn't have a new one in, du in Dubai in Should process. I didn't even finish that, but I think that maybe it will be a good idea. <laughs> Neom, Neom. We can have office here. Yeah. Yeah. We're you you will you. probably get some call uh, <laughs> so, so to, to yeah. relocate from Dubai, Dubai even before your office is ready in Dubai. <laughs> <laughs> Muxit, your perspective on the, on the skill gap, the talent gap, and how to address it? So uh, maybe let's, let's put it in perspective as to where the gap is, right? Um, you know, there's clearly varying levels of gap. If you look at the core uh, industries in any of the regions, right? So you take the Middle East and you say energy is one of the core industries. Oil and gas. The skills gap in oil and gas is not very significant. I mean, there is sufficient level of um, available talent which has the petrotechnical skills. But when you start looking at uh, areas like low carbon uh, energy, you start looking at digital IT capabilities, we find that you know between a quarter to a third um, of the workforce is really adapt uh, at those in those areas. So you've got gaps in certain areas, and those vary by regions, especially on the technology digital side. Since we talked about it a lot, and it's a it's a global theme, that gap is bigger, wider in the Middle East compared to you know the average across the world. It doesn't mean it's wider than almost every country. I mean there are other regions which are actually behind. Um, so I, you know, so let's then think about what are the uh, opportunities to fix that gap, right? I think one of the first ones I would point out, which is also central to the, the Vision 2030, is encouraging more participation from, from women in the workforce. And uh, the kingdom has done a phenomenal job uh, over the last 10 years, right? If you go back to about 2010, less than 10% of the workforce was women. Today, it's a third. Uh, that's a huge improvement, right, compared to any nation in the world. Uh, I think the path forward is how do you continue to empower uh, women to actually enhance their skills and their impact and truly break the glass ceiling when it comes to being CEOs or top leaders in these companies. So I think that aspect and it's clearly embedded and enshrined in the 2030 vision is important. The second one is um, what I would call uncovering sort of the untapped workforce or talent. So these are the hidden workers, the hidden workforce, and this exists across every country on the planet, right? So these are people that are, you know, um, you know that might be, um, you know, displaced because of uh, uh, supporting a partner, there are disabled people, there are refugees. There, there's a whole group of people 
that is in this uh, hidden workforce. And the numbers are substantial. Even in the country uh, like the US where I come from, about 15 to 20%, the equivalent of 15 to 20% of the workforce today sits in what you call a hidden workforce, right? So if you can tap into that talent and really groom it, you start filling some of the gap. The third element is, I think companies have started grasping this, but they have to emphasize the, what I would call the internal incentives or the intrinsic inten incentives uh, for the workforce, which are changing and rapidly evolving, right? A lot of the companies have emphasized the external um, uh, incentives of compensation, promotion. The internal ones are around purpose, ambition, and, and the likes. And what we find is companies that do that better than others have a much higher retention ratio. And then even employees that feel that their work is meaningful have a 70% less chance of leaving the, their employer in the next six months compared to the ones that don't. Um, and then the last thing is, I think Yusuf, you hinted uh, at it, which is around building a culture of continuous growth. And this is about expansion of your skills and the depth of your skills. It's about promoting going to, um, to, you know, to an advanced degree program. It's about supporting um, any loan forgiveness programs. It's also about giving employees a space in their free time to actually go do their own projects. So you got to think about how you can create a much more of a emotional attachment to the employer of choice and then grow those employees. So those are four of the factors that I would point out. No, thanks for that. And you know, we have five minutes to, uh, to go, so I think I would like probably to do a last round because we have to respect that in the last 50 years, the world was talking about what comes first between chicken and eggs. And now we are launching a new paradigm, which is what comes first between technology and culture. So can you share maybe one or two examples where culture are changing technology adoption or where technology is changing the culture in your, let's say, experience and uh, because the interaction between culture and technology and the ability to be truly human. So I think what you put in cognitive city is a city that is more technology heavy, but also more human. That means that will serve humanity, communities in a more accurate way. So culture, technology, what comes first and what are the example of one impacting the the other. It's, a, it's a very interesting one. So I think the, the latter, technology impacting culture, is, as we said, the new meta norm. So the new metaverse will impact culture, will become culture itself in many ways, uh, will define it, and will bring it as a melting pot, and will create a new product. Um, so that's a clear one for me. <laughs> the first one, in terms of where culture impacts technology, I think uh, it's more around rather than impacting technology, um, it's about consumption models and adoption. Mm -hmm. So in, in a cognitive city, as you do a cognitive city of the future in Neom, um, there will be aspects around the culture that will probably change the way we will provision those services. It will change the way we manage the data and we uh, allow access to the data. It will probably push the envelope a little bit um, uh, 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 positively or negatively. It's to be seen uh, around what's really culturally acceptable as an impact of technological advancement versus something that will be a red line. Mm -hmm. And it's nothing that uh, the local community in any country, honestly, um, will accept. This is to be seen. A lot of human-centric studies needs to be done, and you will start by deploying and finding out. My, my prediction that an equilibrium will, will emerge between how much you will give away and, let's say, compromise a little bit around your culture versus the gains you will get. And if the gains, the perceived gains, are higher, I think the new generations will accept it. Remember, the metaverse is not for me or you or anybody in this audience. In fact, it's probably not for our children. I mean, Neom as a city, what we aim to do with the line uh, is, is not something that I don't think any of us would want 
you know, or dream about that. It's for our children. The metaverse is for the children of our children that they will utilize. So we are here coming and discussing it and thinking about it, but the truth is they will define and they will have different boundaries to accept or not to accept. And I think uh, it is, they will be very smart to balance what's in and out for them and what's the benefit and what's the impact. But personally, I think culture um, eats anything else for breakfast. Mm -hmm. <laughs> for me, it's really something that will be impacting not just the technology adoption, but it will be impacting the way we live, work, and play. It will be impacting the way we trade, the way we meet people, the way we um, make friendships, the way um, we get um, healthcare services accessing our data and on, 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 on. So it is, uh, it's a big impact factor on, on everything, not just it's, technology. Yeah, it's a key ingredient. Okay. Alex, your yeah. uh, one minute example yeah, I, I would, on I'll, culture you know, impacting you know, the, the, technology the or the other way. would be very interesting. That's, that's in my office. So I'll check the culture first. Imagine that, so I have a bunch of engineers that are creating technology, right? They're, they're developing technology. And the core of that is that whether they have, we have the same vision and passion about what things we want to create, right? So if, if we, you don't have that innovative culture within my office, there's n no way that we can work out some really creative, creative that's technology that can help the industry and bring out into reality. So I'll take the culture first. Thank you, Muxit. Your closing uh, statement, culture, technology, so what comes I, first? I, I don't think it's an or. Um, I think it's a combination. It's an and. I mean, their culture is important for technological trans or technology-driven transformation to happen. Uh, I want to focus a bit more, because a lot has been said on that, right? How culture underpins big change. I want to focus a little bit on how technology is impacting culture to your original question. And I think there are three dimensions in my mind. One is that culture as a technology is helping the, move the world towards a much more multicultural um, um, environment, if you will, right? I mean, if you think of globalization, often it was thought of as westernization of the world. And that's not really what's happening now with the advent of technology, right? I mean, we all love entertainment. You look at Netflix, you know, uh, three of the top uh, 10 uh, series there are actually non-English programs. Um, you know, even in the Middle East, um, you know, uh, only three of their top uh, viewed programs are actually American English uh, series, right? So you see the, see the shift. You look at an entity like TikTok, a Chinese player with more than a billion subscribers globally, right? You look at things like, you know, a, a Puerto Rican artist being the most uh, you know, subscribed or viewed artists on Spotify. So you see, you know, how technology is creating this multicultural world. The boundaries are moving. Yeah. The second aspect is, you know, how technology is actually allowing us to bridge the, the cultural divide, right? So you think of things like instant language translation, which is now facilitating a lot of business uh, and economic transactions which were less effective before. And it's actually going to benefit developing world regions like the Middle East, mm -hmm. Asia, China, more so than the developed world because of the, the gap that already existed uh, from a cultural mm -hmm. standpoint. Um, the third aspect is technology is actually changing the expectations, uh, you know, um, around what people want, right? So, you know, think of hybrid work, think of social media as a primary form of gathering information or sharing information, right? The shift from performance management to performance enablement driven by technology. And in fact, I said three, but I'll add one more. Totally technology support. as a means of driving, you know, uh, boundaryless collaboration. Now you can connect organizations, and as a result, you create a culture of collaboration, of agility, which wasn't present before. True. So. And we may add a fifth one. I think you will not uh, uh, disapprove, object, if I say that project at a country level like Neom are probably changing 
themselves, the culture, the country, the vision, and the way the communities uh, live around. So leapfrog project, mega project, project that are getting the best of the previous culture and leapfrogging to the new for not us, but our kids or the kids of our kids are probably one of the impactful ingredients of this equation. Thank you very much for your time. It was a very intimate, nice conversation. Now that we rehearse, we can go to the plenary. Yes. And, uh, and thank you and have a great day. Thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you, thank you, you very sir. much. Thank you.